Let me first start off um, in welcoming you. My name is Eileen Alma, and I'm the interim director of the Cody Institute here at St. Francis Xavier University in Anaganish, Nova Scotia. And St. Francis Xavier University is based um, in the beautiful, unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq and Wellesticook peoples. And this is um, uh, an area of, uh, and, and uh, a community of peoples um, that have been here since time immemorial. And we as settlers on this land are grateful to be working with Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples who have welcomed us in as part of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship in 1725. And we, we are honored to work, live and play in this territory. And I, I urge you um, as we're going through our, our, our session today and always to think about the territory that you're located on um, and the first peoples that, uh, that have been caretakers of the land um, yeah, since time immemorial. So a, well, a warm welcome to all of you from St. FX, from Cody Institute. And I'm really delighted about the, um, to host this session today with John McKnight and Cormac Russell, because as many as you, of you will know, um, the work around citizen-led and asset-based community de development is part of the Cody Institute's DNA. Um, it's, um, it's the way that we, we think about the world, the way that we work with communities, ensuring that communities are the ones who are drivers of their own destinies. And as Moses, Father Moses Cody would have said, our, our, the namesake of our institute, um, helping to ensure that, you, um, that communities can gain what they don't have by starting um, with looking at what they do have already. So in other words, starting with the community's assets rather than deficits. And in many cases, this is a, a shift in the way that we work in the world. Um, we're so used to having development paradigms that are, that are colonizing, that start with needs-based approaches. Um, and what we, what we intend in, 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 um, as, a, as a differentiator here is to ensure that communities are the, are the drivers of, their, of change and of their destinies. And so this work has been part of Cody, uh, Cody's work and prior to Cody Institute, which will be, is 64 years old, the work of St. FX's ex, ex, uh, former extension department, which is close to 100 years old and you know, really was born out of the Anaganish movement, which helped communities here in Atlantic Canada really uh, look at development um, together, um, ensuring that the community members themselves were, were thinking about solutions especially during very hard times for many sectors and for the, for the province as a whole. So, you know, more than two decades, I would argue close to three decades ago, some of our colleagues, and I see uh, at least one of them right now on the screen in the center of my screen, Gord Cunningham, but not just Gord, but Allison Mathy, Brianne Peters, and many, many other colleagues have long um, followed the work of John McKnight, and uh, who is a co-founder of the ABCD Institute. Um, many decades ago, John, you, you came to um, New Brunswick and Allison and Gord were so taken with the work that you were, you were sharing. They, they brought back many of the concepts and teachings and they brought that into Cody Institute. And it was a very big alignment uh, that, uh, with, the, with the direction that we were already taking. So. ABCD and our connection points on asset-based community development and particularly with the ABCD Institute um, have been, you know, have stretched now for several decades. So it's an absolute pleasure to, pleasure to have John and Cormac joining us today and in particular talking about their new book, which is called The Connected Community, Discovering the Health, Wealth and Power of Neighborhoods. And um, I'm going to turn over to them in a moment, but let me introduce you to John and Cormac a little bit. Um, first of all, I'll start with John. Um, uh, you know, he's a legend, at least in my mind, and I have not been able to work as close with John as some of my colleagues have. But, you know, the, over the years, over the last decade, I've heard just about every week um, a reference to John and his work and, and the founding principles um, that he brought into the ABCD Institute. And to give you a sense of the of the scope of his career, you know he started off. You know uh, he he was originally uh, was raised in Ohio. He he's lived all he lived all over the place in many different neighborhoods and small towns, um, and then he went to Northwestern University, and you know he um, he was working or he was educated at that time by a faculty 
that was really dedicated to preparing students to be effective citizens. Um, he, when he graduated, he went into the U.S. Navy, where he worked, uh, where he had three years of what he calls postgraduate education um, in Asia during the Korean War. And then he returned to, New to Chicago, and he's, he worked with several activist organizations, um, including the Chicago Commission for Human Relations, which was the first municipal civil rights agency. Um, he, when, when uh, John F. Kennedy was elected president, John was recruited into the federal government, the U.S. federal government, where he worked with a new agency that created the Affirmative Action Program. And later he was the Midwest director of the, U the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, where he worked with local civil rights and neighborhood organizations. Gosh, that's already a lot. But in 1969, he returned to Northwestern University and he's helped to create a new department called the Center for Urban Affairs. And that was a group of interdisciplinary faculty that was doing research on urban change agency and progressive urban policy. Um, and you know, it, he, it gave him a tenured professorship even though he had about only a bachelor's degree. So they recognized the talents, the expertise and the education of John. Um, early, early on. And while he was there, he and his colleague and close friend, the late Jody Kretzman, focused their research on urban neighborhoods. And then later on, um, they, they work um, gradually became um, part of the founding of the ABCD Institute um, that remains to this date. So he has had, um, I mean, that's only a piece of what I could describe of your, of your background, John, and your and the work that you've done really to advance um, communities, to advance citizenship, to advance the concept of democracy. Um, and you know, we'll learn more of that today when, when we hear from you as well. So a really thank, big thank you for you to be here. And he's joined by Cormac, who is a co-author with him on the book that we'll be talking about today. And Cormac is a, a social explorer and author, and he's a, a, a very much sought after specialist, especially in ABCD. He's the founding director of Nurture Development, and he's also a member of the ABCD um, Institute in Chicago, as some of our own Cody colleagues are as well. And over the last 25 years, Cormac's work has demonstrated an enduring impact on 35 different countries around the world, training communities, uh, agencies, NGOs, and governments in ABCD. And um, in addition to the book that we that they'll talk about today, he's also uh, recently uh, published another book called Rekindling Democracy, A Professional's Guide to Working in Citizen Space in 2020. So John and Cormac, um, again, thank you very much for, um, for joining us today. And I'm really looking forward to an amazing conversation. I turn over to you now, John, to, to start that conversation going and looking forward to everybody's participation over the course of the, the next hour. So thank you. And over to you, John. Well, I am so pleased to be with a group of people who are, I think, mostly from Canada, because I've spent an awful lot of time over in my years in Canada. I think Canada has been especially receptive to the ideas behind the asset-based community development. Uh, in fact, uh, if you go a lot, as I have, back and forth between Canada and the United States, <clears throat> you begin to understand how different we are as countries. Uh, Canada is uh, what the United States would be like if the United States were a reasonable place. And so I've always loved to be in uh, a place where it seems to me People are more collegial and uh, more reasonable. And that's why I think ABCD has also been more acceptable. The name of the book is uh, <clears throat> A Connected Community. And I think its utility is in any relatively small space, small place. And uh, it, uh, let me tell you how it came about. <clears throat> I was in Ireland where uh, Cormac comes from and I was with my wife and, and we went to the west of Ireland and stayed a little, in a little town 
20 houses, I think, and maybe uh, one church and one grocery store. And outside the town was a lake. And I'm a fisherman, so I carry with me a collapsible rod and a reel. <laughs> so I'm ready to fish. And I didn't have any bait. <clears throat> so I went into town and walked into the only store there was. It had a little path that led into it. And inside was an older Irish gentleman. And... Uh, I said to him, uh, sir, I'd love to fish in that lake outside of town, but I don't have any bait. And he said to me, well, what do you mean bait? And I said, well, like worms. And he looked at me in a way I'll never forget because it was sort of life changing. He said to me, now, Sonny, when you walked up the path to the house, did you know, I mean, to my store, did you notice the three big stones on either side of your path? I said, well, I guess. And he said, I think if you go out and you turn each of those stones over, you'll find all the worms that you need. And I have never forgotten that because, you know, I was going to, buy something that was all around me. I was almost standing on it. And it was a revelatory moment for me because I realized I didn't know where I was and where I was was a place that had so many things that I could use. And I took that idea from that old Irish gentleman and uh, got an appointment at Northwestern University where there were a lot of scholars, mostly focused on cities and neighborhoods. And I, I found that they were all doing studies based on conceptions of neighborhoods and cities as deficient problem places. And the research was designed to fix the places and people in the neighborhood. Now, the first half of my career was in neighborhoods as a neighborhood organizer. And I was sort of stunned to see that everybody in government, everybody in agencies, everybody uh, that was concerned about cities was starting with the premise that this is a broken place because I had come from those places. I had organized in those places and I knew that the people in those places were often the creators of their future, that they lived in a place that they tended to see as helpful, useful, and they had done a lot of things that made life better. But nobody in academia or in governments at that time, this has been 1993, I think, nobody had apparently done any research about what was there in the neighborhood. What did people produce? What did they produce it with? And so uh, my colleague then at that time, at this center was Jody Kretzman. We had his funeral only this Saturday, but he was my colleague through the years. And we both thought, why don't we do a study in which we find out what is there that people use when they make things better rather than a study that starts out with identifying deficits and figuring out how outside resources could fix them. So we did such a study and, and we did it in 20 different cities. I think four of them were in Canada. They were mostly in neighborhoods, uh, largely in older neighborhoods. And we asked this question of the people there. And the question was, can you tell us what people who live here have done together 
to make things better. Let me say, we tried a lot of questions, it didn't work, but that one does, so let me repeat it. Can you tell us what people who live here have done together that has made things better? And we collected over 2,000 stories that people told us in response to that question. And this day, we didn't ask leaders. We asked people in the middle of a block. We didn't know. We just knocked on their, uh, on their door. And uh, when we had collected all of these stories, we uh, then thought, well, now, how could they be most useful? And uh, one of the ways that we decided was, why don't we take the story and see what it was that people used that was there that made life better? What did they use that was there that made life better? And we took every story and asked, well, what was there that they used? And after looking at all of them, we concluded that there were six ba basic resources that people were using in these stories when they were producers, when they were making uh, things better. And we had to find a, a way of, uh, of defining them. And uh, you can see the chart now. There were, we thought in the stories, uh, six, uh, we call them assets. I would prefer to call them building blocks, or you could call them ingredients, but six basic building blocks that appeared in, in the stories and seemed to be comprehensive as to what people used. Uh, let me just read these quickly, and then I want to say a few words more about each of them. Uh, the first is, of course, the ability, skills, and capacities of the local residents. The second is the clubs, groups, and organizations they formed to help them connect with each other in ways that would result in their being able to make things better. The third uh, asset or building block we found was very local institutions, places like a fire station or a local hardware store or perhaps a YMCA. And the fourth one was exchange. We found that people were sharing, trading, bartering, buying, and selling. And when that process was kept within the community so that when an exchange took place, it didn't take place mainly outside, it took place inside. So the money kept circulating within the neighborhood. The fifth building block was the neighborhood itself, the place, the and everything that was on top of it and everything that was underneath it. And finally, there were stories. And we think stories are key assets in building uh, a uh, culture. So those are the building blocks, we think, that are used when people are at the center and are uh, are in, in control. They are the ingredients. So let me say a few words uh, about each of those uh, building blocks. <clears throat> uh, let's start with the individuals in a neighborhood. What uh, we found over and over again is that if you ask people what they value most about themselves, what they think they have 
that is valuable enough it could be contributed that that's a way of understanding what they do in the asset building approach and we generally have found that a way not just the way a way to approach the individuals in a neighborhood and find out about what the nature of their building block is that they have to contribute is to ask them four questions. And the first is, what are your gifts? And by gifts, we mean things you were born with. My sister was a very good singer, and yet she was born with a beautiful voice. She didn't learn it. I was not born, born with a beautiful voice. So there, there was a big difference, but she is a gift of singing. Then the second question that we can ask individuals is, can you tell us what are your skills? What do you think are your most significant skills that you've learned over the years? And they can give you all kinds of answers to that question from child raising to playing chess. And then the third question is, can you tell us what are, are your passions? What do you care enough about that you have acted on it? And this leads us into, they, they may never have acted on their gifts or with their gifts or with their skills, but passions are a way of finding out where they have acted. Well, I'm concerned enough about that filthy stream that runs through our neighborhood that I got six neighbors and we got together with a bunch of kids and we began spending the spring cleaning up our stream. That's my passion. And the last thing uh, that you can ask is, well, can you tell us uh, what is uh, your, uh, what do you know well enough that you could teach it to somebody else, an adult or young people, focusing especially on young people. If you ask somebody those four questions, you are liable to walk away from the house with 10 to 30 capacities that they have, most of which have never been used in behalf of the neighborhood. So asset-based development is a way of understanding what is there, like the worms, and getting it activated. Now, the next uh, asset is the clubs, groups, organizations, and association. And they are people in the neighborhood who come together to become more powerful sharing their gift so that they can get things done, so that they multiply their power, they magnify their capacity through associations that they create. The third asset is the local institutions. I named uh, a couple like uh, maybe a, a local school or a barber shop or a garbage collection group in the city. At any rate, the important thing is that they are useful, these institutions, but the further they are away from the neighborhood, the, the less useful they become. So that we're thinking especially about those institutions that are in the neighborhood. Now, of all the things that I'd like to share with you, 
through our research. It is to make very clear the difference between associations and institutions. They are two tools. They are very different. They're like a hammer and a saw. They don't do basically the same thing. They are ways people organize themselves to get things done. And so we, we have institutions as a triangle because there's usually one person at the top. We have associations as a circle because it's really equal people who want to participate together. But they're very different because they're different tools. They do different things. And when you hear people say organization, they may mean institutions or they may mean association or and lump them together. And when they do that, then they'll probably fail. Okay. Um, so just to help you see the difference, an institution is organized so that it can produce control, right? That reason they're all triangles is there's somebody ultimately at the top. Whereas in associations, you can't control them. They are a group of people who are operating on the basis of choice. The reason you want to control an institution is because you can produce a lot of stuff, goods or services. But in the associational world, in a neighborhood, it's not very good at producing lots of stuff. But it is a place that instead of services, produces care. It is where care resides. Care is the commitment we have to one another and you can't sell it. You can sell a service, but care is what is there of great value in a neighborhood. Neighborhoods could be made up of people who are clients or consumers in the United States, we talk how much our, our communities are, are consumer societies. But you can't do anything uh, indigenous when people are clients or consumers. They have to be citizens. So citizen space is wherever people are productive together. And finally, in institutions, they need needs. That's why when we went to university, we found all the research was about needs because that's the raw material for an institution. But in a neighborhood, what we need is capacity, gifts, skills, passion, and knowledge. So can we get back to, to all of us? <laughs> The, the third building block uh, is, uh, I mean, the fourth, <laughs> the fourth, the fourth building block is the place, the buildings on top of it. Maybe it has gold underneath it. But I think the thing that is most significant about a place is that if you can see what is maybe invisible to most people, it the place has messages for us. And the message from a place is, there are things that are fit to do here. And if you listen and hear that voice, telling you what fits the land and this place, 
then you will begin to grow in respect for the environment, right? The fifth of these uh, assets is uh, chain. That is all of the connecting of things that people do, sometimes for money, at the local level, most of the time, not for money, but more likely to be giving, sharing, contributing, trading, right? And that process keeps resources inside rather than sending them out. And that's a key factor in exchange. And the last of these five, is stories and stories have at least two characteristics the first is they are a way of capturing what we have done and in them what worked and what didn't work so a neighborhood stories are like a catalog of learnings they are the ways we capture the the knowledge from our work but even more important stories are the are the key elements of building a culture they embed a culture and so we need to recognize their importance and to lift them up in all of what i have said there are two other things that are important and number one is this works when everybody is involved when everybody is included so every time you don't include somebody because they may seem a little different you also have excluded their gifts, their talents, their passion, and you've made yourself weaker. So the strongest a neighborhood can be is it's a place where everybody's unique and special gifts are connected. And the last thing I would say needed, needs to be added is the inclusion of young people in all our associational work, right? That I think you don't need to spend an awful lot of time figuring out new ways to put young people together in youth programs. They already have youth programs and a lot of them might not thought to be too good. But what makes a strong community is that young people are early on producers, just like adults. And their gifts are integrated in the process. So inclusion and young people need be a focus of the neighborhood and its building blocks. Now, it doesn't <clears throat> make too much sense to know what the building blocks are, but, but not have something to build with them. And I wanna turn the, uh, the program <laughs> over to, uh, Cormac Russell, wonderful, wonderful, insightful colleague of mine, and uh, let him lead us through thinking about the kinds of functions that all these building blocks can be used to make life better at the local level. Cormac? Thanks, John. It's always a joy to listen to John. Um, the 2023 is the 30th anniversary of of the green book and you know it's it's an incredible uh, legacy which just keeps growing and uh, keeps opening out new possibilities this is very special uh, not just because of that but also because we're being hosted by world 
uh, I think, luminaries when it comes to thinking about principles of cooperativism, women's leadership, and working from the ground up uh, in an asset-based way. And of course, that's Cody, Eileen, uh, Gord, Brian, team. Thank you so much for giving us space, uh, inviting us to co-conspire with you. And uh, featuring uh, this new book just briefly to say the book is written for doers so it's, we thought we'd be in lockdown for a couple of years back in 2020 like a lot of people we thought we better do something be useful uh with our with our spare time we ended up being wrong we actually ended up being busier than ever uh, it's, it turns out that uh, we were together apart on zoom and uh, had a lot of fun uh being alongside communities we also wrote this book, which in a sense is, it's not a roadmap, it's it's more a compass. It, it's, I think, for folks who want to travel uh, at the speed of trust, uh, but really want to get a sense of what is it we might do at neighbor to neighbor level in local small places and uh, why we might do it. So John's been talking about what we have to do the work with, and I just want to say a word or two about what is the work. <laughs> so one of the fundamental questions, and it's it's so key now, isn't it? We think a lot about change work and everybody will tell you, you got to start with your why. Why are you doing this? What's the purpose? What motivates you? And in a sense, I think that's a really key question, which has been at the heart of community building work all over the world. So that first question is, what do you care about enough that if three of your neighbors helped you, you'd love to do together? What is that? It might be playing chess. It might be playing, you know, in an orchestra. It might be protesting in Germany uh, against uh, the damage that we're doing to our environment. It can be you know, there's all sorts of scales at which people find expression of joining in solidarity to do something that isn't just about me. It moves from ego to eco, right? It moves from me to we. It moves from that idea of the rugged individual to Ubuntu. I am because we are. And we're joined by so many people today who are grounded, actually, in the core belief and principle that we are not self-reliant, we're other reliant. So that question of what is it we need to do together is a really key question. And particularly on the canvas or at the scale of a neighborhood, a favela, a small village, a township, what is it we might be able to do if we thought of ourselves, our neighbors, and all of the assets that John was talking about as parts of an organism? as parts of this Ubuntu that takes us beyond just one species, which is human. And there are 8 million species on the planet. We're the only species that can actually be present and not show up. Every other species kind of tends to be, right? But in a sense, what might we do if we all showed up as having a responsibility, as in an ability to respond to not just each other, or the people we like because they worship whoever we worship or they you know, vote uh, the same way as we vote. But people we call neighbor, even people whose opinions we don't like, but who will dig a pea patch garden with. What might we achieve towards a better, more decent life with them? And what we've come to see is that the clearer people can be about the work that they can do as citizens in a place the clearer it is what we might be looking for when it comes to the assets. So when I say to a neighbor, what do you care about enough to act upon with some other people around here? And if I'm in Macaulay neighborhood or North Glenora in Edmonton, where they're doing fantastic ABCD work, the story might start a little like this. Somebody says there's 5,000 people living in this neighborhood, but you know, the thing is we're not connected. We have no sense of common purpose. There's lots and lots of people who live here, but in many respects, they travel in and out of our neighborhoods like they're tourists on a bus with the curtains drawn. You know, they're just being conveyed to and from work or the marketplace. But what would happen if instead of just living around here, we actually showed up purposefully as a collective neighbor? And this really, the spirit of uh, Father Moses Cody is the great visionary that arcs over this conversation, because, of course, that's a question of cooperativism. 
And it's so important that we get to know this uh, work that we're talking about, this neighborly work, before we need to. You know, it's always a good idea to get to know your neighbor uh, before a plague, <laughs> before you need them. So in many respects, this question is a neglected question. And this book that we've written, which, uh, you know, is, is an attempt to feature the question, is called The Connected Community. Because I think a community is, that's connected is connected around a clear set of functions. So if we go back to the likes of Glenora, where they are trying to connect their community together, what you would see if you were a fly on the wall in that neighborhood is you'd see a community builder and connectors who are out at block level and at street level and are trying to discover what people care about enough to act upon together. What I love about the work, and I've seen this happen in so many places around the world, and most recently I was just uh, reminiscing about some of the work in the Gasaba district uh, in Kigali in Rwanda. And I you know, was reminded of this wonderful happenstance of a story where parents who had built a local school were talking about one of the issues or the concerns that they had and they wanted to work on, which was that many of their children were traveling on foot many, many miles to get to school and were hungry, you know, going through the whole school day, not ha having enough to eat. So they collectivized, they got together uh, with the support of the Wellspring Foundation, which is actually a Canadian foundation working in Rwanda. They began the process of using what they have to secure what they need. So they started growing Kigali and they started growing bananas. Now, the problem with that is, is if you grow these kinds of produce, you have to fertilize them. They didn't have money for fertilizer. And it's such a beautiful story, this, because one of the students said, you do know that urine is a fertilizer if you mix it proportionately with some water. So they started to build their own lavatories and they actually harvested the urine of the students. This is not a story, by the way. This is a story you hear in certain hemispheres and not on others, right? Uh, but this is such a wonderful story because they gathered together and harvested the urine, which they used as fertilizer. And from that story, they actually created a little micro enterprise where they sold excess fertilizer uh, to other places. They called the business G Wiz. You just could not make this up. But out of that story, many of the parents started gathering together and wondering what would happen if the 15, 16 villages from which these kids walk could begin to think in a similar way about what they have and how they could discover, connect and mobilize what they have. And in all kinds of ways, what they started to discover was that we can join together and we can take on seven key functions. And if we take them on, we can do it in a way that actually creates a sense of joy and creates outcomes that are enduring. Let me just, I have noise going on in the background here. Let me just turn it off. So let me show you the seven functions that we see over and over again as people discover, connect, and mobilize at the local neighborhood level. So these are the seven functions which we feature uh, in the book. Can you see this okay? It's jumping a little on my screen, so I'll stop and try again. What's really interesting is, you know, function is not a word, I think, that you would commonly hear uh, th mentioned with regard to community. You know, we think about maybe a tin opener having having a function, or, you know, we think about a hospital as having the function of patching us up when we're when we're not feeling well. But you know, when we think about what is the function of a community, it's not a thought I think that's easy to hold in our heads. And that's what I want to really think through. So what were these communities in North Glenora and Edmonton and these villages in, in, in the Gasabo district in Rwanda? What were they what, what work were they doing? which was unique. And why are we saying in the book that we think that work is peculiar and particular to the capacities of collective neighborhood action? Why that? We want to unpack that a little bit. So let us say that, first of all, in the book, we feature seven functions, seven pieces of work, seven vocations that collectively at the neighborhood level are essential to uh, living a good life, living into Ubuntu in a way that really stewards the local ecology as well. 
What's interesting about the stories I've shared is, is that in each of the stories, we don't just see that it's a story about education with respect to the school, or it's a story about neighborhood beautification and looking after the environment in respect of North Lenora. We see also that because people are joining together to make things better, regardless of what they're doing, that they are healthful in the very act of doing that. In fact, if I live in Glenora and I'm not a member of an association and I join one because they're doing this and they're inviting me in for my gifts, I am 50%, statistically at least, 50% less likely to die next year. That's incredible. By doing this work, we improve the collective health, the population health of our neighborhoods on average by about 27%. What's also really striking is, is that in the two stories that I briefly shared with you, we're not just seeing a project. What we're seeing is health, we're seeing education, but we're also seeing people feeling safer. Because in the process of getting to know each other and working together and working out not just problems, but also possibilities, what they're actually doing is they're creating security. They're producing security in the sense that two of the key determinants of what creates safety and security are how many neighbors you know by first name and how often you do things together that creates a sense of agency and a sense of vibrancy. It also creates passive oversight in the actual neighborhood. Often we think of so many of the stories, obviously, when it comes to community work, touch on ecology, as John said, what's on the ground, below the ground, and I would say above the ground as well. So ecology is a really nice way, I think, of thinking about what's within us and what surrounds us, our inner and our outer landscape, and what it is that we can do to connect all of those possibilities. Now, the fundamental question here is like you think about, for example, the Scottish island like the Isle of Egg, where an entire island in 2008 went off grid and essentially generate their own energy through wind and solar. It's mainly wind. There's quite a lot of wind out in the Hebrides. But what, what motivated them? Was it ecology? Were they all environmental activists? No, actually. What motivated them was that their biggest export was their young people. And as they looked into the future, they realized they weren't going to survive. And one of the things they wanted to organize around was generating enough income to invest in young people's ideas and enterprise. And they knew that one of the ways they could do that was harvest the asset of ecology to allow them do that work. So in all kinds of ways, what we find is people use these functions as like entry points. You know, different people will have different passions. But what we're really interested in is, is how those different functions can speak to each other, can be braided or woven together so that there's a dynamism. And that's the great possibility, I think, in the threshold of a neighborhood. It gives us this perfect scale. The city is too big. There's just too many people going in too many different directions. The street's a little bit too small. But when somebody says to me, there's all these things happening within the scale at block and affinity level in a neighborhood, all kinds of possibilities emerge. And yet it's not too far away. It's in door knocking distance. I can get involved. And as John was saying, the great message here culturally is, is that everybody is in. In terms of food production, Again, we see that in so many ways through food cooperatives and in efforts to create food sovereignty like the GBIS story, what I think we're seeing is, is we're seeing people also trying to put their hand back in the soil again and reconnect with what it is they put into their bodies in season, in nutritious ways, and in ways that they feel that they themselves have some kind of contribution and responsibility to. And John has talked already about raising our children, but I'm reminded as I come to the end of my input of a story from Shreveport, Louisiana, where over the course of about a year ago in a school, over the course of three days, over 23 pupils were arrested for physical violence in the school corridor. This is one of these schools where they've got scanners that the kids go through and they've got security guards. And I think, you know, as I reflect on it, I think that 
the arrest of those kids and the subsequent incarceration of those kids was, wasn't the failure of the security guards or the police or the, you know, the principal or the counselors. They were all really good people. But what happened on day number four, I think, is what I want to lift up and how this was such a powerful expression of care. 40 dads living in the neighborhoods from which the kids come and go to school stepped forward and they came and they sat with the principal and they said, you know what? We think you got a village problem in the school and we want to do something about that. And they set up what they call dads on duty. And these dads each day, about 10 or 11, they got 40 so they can you know, cover the whole week. They go into the corridors and they love their children and their neighbor's children. They subject them to bad dad jokes like I do with my boys every day. They give them high fives and they love them back to peace. They're not vigilantes. They're vigilant elders that understand that there's work to be done. It doesn't just take a village to raise a child, but it also takes us being willing to grow a village where there's a culture of care, where every child's gifts can be welcomed in today, not when they're 18. And where we can begin to see that what we're describing here, and I'll finish on this, and we're, we're keen to hear your voices, so we're going to go into breakout uh, and uh, some deeper discussion. But our thought for what it's worth, if we try to say, you know, in summation, what is this book? I think this book is, it's a celebration. It's a celebration of what's possible. If we could recognize that every neighborhood, every village, every villa, every slum, name it as you will, every small place where we are related physically, by our connections to all the assets John has talked about, is like a weaver's loom. And in that loom, each of these seven functions are like threads. Our challenge, the work that we do, the work that Cody are doing, the work that the alumni are doing, and the work that our friends that are here today are doing. And we've got so many allies because it's not just the 30th anniversary of the Green Book, it's the 50th anniversary of that wonderful book, Small is Beautiful by E.F. Schumacher. So many of us reminding each other that we are not independent, we're interdependent. All of these functions are threads that are calling each other into a tapestry. The work that we do through community building is the work of building that tapestry. The neighborhood is the perfect scale within which to do it. And we feel the process of discovering, connecting, and mobilizing is really the work of building the connected community. So what we'd like to do, these are just reflections. It's hard to summarize the book in you know, 40 minutes, but hopefully it gives you a feel for the heart as well as the, the mind of the book. Um, probably prompts questions, which is a healthy thing to do. But what we're also really keen to uh, hear from you is what's going on in your context, because you're the wisdom holders, we're guests in, 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 in your conversation. So we're gonna go to breakout for, I think we have 20 minutes, Eileen, is that still the case? So we'll go to breakout for 20 minutes and you may have a better question when you get to your smaller group and please by all means substitute uh, what I'm offering you in a moment for that better question. But if you want to, uh, here's a question that you may also uh, consider. Can you see that? You can, good, my screen is jumping. So what, what we're offering here is a bit of a, a good faith uh, reflection on everything we've talked about. And we think going back to that original sharing that John had, is that it all comes down to stories. So we'd like to invite you to share a story from your own life experience, where local connections, people to people, neighbor to neighbor, in your neighborhood, made a difference, made life better. And that could be directly or indirectly. Uh, so we're not looking for very big stories. It could be two, three people getting together and walking dogs and addressing loneliness that way. It just what we're looking for are authentic experiences that you've had, where you've seen neighbors come together to make things better. But now you get bragging rights if you can go a little bit further. 
So the best stories, the, the, you know, the signature stories will be the stories where we begin to see more and more ripple effects, more and more neighbors being involved. And in a sense, that's what this book is. It's full of stories about how you can create that ripple effect and you can create that tapestry. So you really get a whole of neighborhood culture going on. But don't feel pressure. It may be that you know them and will be excited to hear them, or you may just want to talk about how you've connected with neighbours over COVID. So whatever makes sense to you will be absolutely welcome and fine. We're going to take 20 minutes. Uh, you'll yeah. be in groups of... For Mac, I'm just going to suggest maybe 15, just so we can make sure we have enough time also to hear from Carrie Lynn later in the, uh, in the, in the session. Good call. Thanks. Thanks, Eileen. So 15 minutes... One thing that I've noticed also, like in, in terms of talking about the seven functions and even the, the, the contributors, you know, those six asset contributors is um, the, I, I guess where I come in is where I stress the, the, um, the movement away from exclusion and the emphasis on inclusion and what happens when it does, when, when it doesn't occur. So, I mean, you mentioned it, but that's, you know, when I think about applying a gender-based analysis or a, or a gender approach to it, when I look at rights and agency, I'm looking at that nexus. So each of those seven functions are, are spaces where I would say, okay, this is good, but what's traditionally, you know, even as we're doing the good work in our neighborhoods, even as we're doing the good work as, as residents, you know, we still don't realize sometimes what we're who we're excluding and why and how those actions need to shift. So this is where I've, we're spending a lot of time right now, and Cody is really looking at that that intersection of diversity and inclusion with the citizen-led asset-based approach. And the women's center within the Cody is focused on that vertical accountability piece in addition to the horizontal. So I see a lot of a lot of movement in that direction. So that's that it. I it's music to my ears, Eileen. Really, really great to hear that. And there's so much work to be done. I, it's frontier work, but it's incredibly careful work. It, it demands a huge amount of reflection. And then practical, you know, unpacking. And a lot of people are looking for practical tools and heuristics and resources to help them move into the field and, mm -hmm. you know, just integrate that way of being uh, in their facilitative practice. So over and over again, we're hearing as we do the work, you know, um, people looking for skills around uh, really deeply bringing inclusion into the practice, uh, bringing a rights-based analysis into the practice, intersectionality, a lot of people asking questions about uh, bringing um, trauma-informed practice into the conversation mm -hmm. and where that fits. So, uh, yeah, we're <laughs> still, well, I still feel we have lots and lots to learn. Well, I think this we all do, and I and uh, this is where I, I get excited about um, the direction of our work with um, with colleagues like Carrie Lynn, who you're meeting for the first time, and you know, just uh, Carrie Lynn. Uh, I don't want to speak for Carrie Lynn, but I am a huge admirer for how she's really reclaimed the ABCD language, and um, not just tried to indigenize it, but right. actually, you know remind people that it or it the origins came from indigenous communities not the other way around but carrie lynn you can speak for yourself on this it's just my admiration for carrie lynn that i'm reflecting on right now <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean i'll i i put together a couple of slides but just i mean my efforts have been really towards how can how can i use an ABCD approach, but in a way that resonates with um, Indigenous communities. And um, we ended up call it, calling it um, building on abundance in Indigenous communities, because it really is that reminder of, yes, we've always had abundance in our communities. And people keep telling us or have told us um, historically that we don't, and we need to reclaim that um, those gifts. Uh, that we all have and we all bring and and how that was the very foundation of how our communities functioned prior to contact mm -hmm. and um yeah just I I guess take pride in that again yeah. and and really it's it's re 
rearranging how we think about ourselves and about the others that are around us. Yeah, it's powerful. Yeah, yeah and it's so true. Working alongside some folks in El Spectac in uh, New Brunswick, you know, and uh, actually just doing the practical being in the community and walking around the community and allowing for the lament as well as the possibilities of discovering abundance that is the the, the hurt, the trauma, the, the absolute injustice, you know. Um, and it's really interesting to hear uh, many of the young people who were involved in the community uh, discovery process saying, you know, what, what we're discovering are all of the things that haven't happened because of the damage that's been done. Mm -hmm. So we don't have elder care centers here. Uh, you know, there there are opportunities around taxi services here because after a certain time, the taxis won't drop us out here, the cabs, you know, and it, it, just really hearing this storied, nuanced narrative that has so much to uh, do with infringements of rights and structural racism and uh, gender-based violence. And even like that, I mean, you know, one of the things that struck me was when I was there, walking around this incredibly beautiful school and talking to one of the elders and the elders saying, yeah, you know, I, he's saying, you will not see a school like this everywhere. And I said, why? And he said, because some of our leaders are not actually being good stewards, particularly at male level. They have kind of fallen into the funding trap. And uh, he, you know, just an incredible conversation that takes us beyond this little, you know, simplistic idea of good, bad, right, wrong, or, you know, um, all, 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 all the issues are on one side and all of the solutions are on the other, to this deep complexity about how toxic and corrosive our funding systems are and how colonial they are and how it's actually really still about subjugation and control, you know? Um, so... In any case, what you're saying really resonates. Yeah, and I, I would say kind of the best kind of leaders that I've seen, you know, because because there's a lot of nuance to understanding leadership and community on reserve. Um, and there's obviously deep colonial history there. Um, but when we when our leaders do get get in that mindset of I am serving the government because that's who's funding us not I'm serving my community in the best way I can and it just so happens that our funder is federal and um you know but their but their their focus is on community that's those are the best kind of leaders I think um that are that are standing with their community not necessarily standing with their funders or their or the or the feds um, absolutely absolutely that's beautiful how what are your reflections on what you've heard so far Carrie Lynn for, from today I, I I think for me it's always goes back to story and I'm going to talk about some principles that um we developed by listening to the stories the very stories that um John talked about you know what what have you done in your community um together and um so we've asked that question over the last 11 years and um or, or more I would say and and just Listening to the themes and listening to what we heard from those stories, um, it really is many principles that come from the ABCD Institute principles or Tamarax principles. Um, they really go back to recognizing what's already there and how do we bring our values also into those principles, you know, whether it's like collective care or um including you know leadership that includes everyone or every voice um all things that i think have been said in the book but um just saying them in a different way that that resonates with the audience that that we work with and yeah and and i think the while the principles won't obviously apply blanketly um we we've had good feedback in terms of um how they do resonate with people and yeah. you know i think at the end of the day it everything is about hope and if we can build in opportunities for people to learn 
and have strategy around um, how to bring hope to community. And I, I think we're in the we're in a good direction. Yeah, the so. two things that kind of stick out for me are are, are in terms of story. So um, I think in the book you talked about it uh, about a mosaic about the different pieces of mm-hmm. of um, yeah. or different colors in a mosaic, and then and then your story about the weaving of the the tapestry um, or John's story about looking under a rock like those to me are the things that um, resonate with me but I think that's because it's it's uh, wrapped in story yeah well we're finding exactly the same feedback though wherever we go you know so there's got to be some deep wisdom in that and 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 truth and even as people set up the um, the reading circles there's many many reading circles John and I have always just imagined that the book is is really just a starter for 10. I mean, the real magic is in the conversation. It's not in the book. So the book mm-hmm. always then just becomes an excuse or an on-ramp sometimes. It's not the only, uh, you know, way to, 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 to prompt the conversation. But it is interesting that it's, it's triggering it. The other thing we're doing uh, at Nurture is uh, we're developing a companion a self-directed course. Uh, that people can take with the book so you know because a lot of people are saying well the book's great it's a good start but uh, we want more we want more tools we want more resources but also just more practical things like what are three really cool things that I could do to have a conversation to invite people to share stories to you know so we were just uh, spitballing earlier on uh, with friends and somebody said hey you know d- don't talk about acid walks or acid maps nobody talks like that <laughs> you know talk about toss the penny you know and I remembered it as a kid you, you, you remember that game toss a penny you go out on the street you toss a penny and if it lands on heads you go left if it lands on tails you go right right so she was saying like get people to do toss a penny you know everybody has a penny you toss a penny you fall, you know and you know to just keep it simple and i think that's what's exciting there's just the genie is out of the bottle and folks are just kind of playing with this now so it's democratizing it mm-hmm. i think we need to get it out of the institute out of you know the voices of people like john and i are just out there right it's just this will grow because we give it away and you know, use this to feature people who don't tend to get featured. I mean, that's that's the hope. Welcome back. Wonderful. I think we're all back. So great, a nice, cozy group as we come to the end of our conversation here today, and the most important part of the conversation, which is where Carrie Lynn helps us to reflect on the sharings that we're going to have now uh, over the next few minutes. Uh, and also some of the sharings of earlier on. So really keen to hear some of what's alive for you, really, following that uh, small breakout conversation, which could come in the shape of a question, a reflection, a musing, or even uh, an invitation to come and visit you someday. So anybody want to get us started just in terms of that open question of what's alive for you, or perhaps what struck you through the conversation that you just had? And if you want to use your on land hand, you could just raise it. We're small enough as a group or the more clever people among us can use the digital devices. We'd like to get us started. Chat is also available, obviously. Zach, did I see you put your hand up or were you just uh, motioning? Yes. Thank you for getting us started, Zach. So if you unmute and uh, tell us what's on your heart and your mind and uh, go from there. Will do, sir. I think that one of the struggles that both me and Amanda talked a bit about was that it's, it sometimes feels like pulling teeth to try and engage the people in your direct community. It's, it's sometimes really hard without a, uh, a sufficient core of people saying, we believe in this already and we want to walk this out. And I think one of the struggles is trying to find, um, I think she said this at the very end, those things that, that kind of spark people's interest and that draw them together to be the things that start um, a movement. And I think that this is where in a local context, it's hard when you're in your neighborhood by yourself trying to say, I want to create spaces of connectedness. I want to create uh, spaces where people feel welcome. But um it's different when i'm able to do that as a as a group 
where I'm able to say, hey, me and Amanda, we're doing this together. It's not just Zach sitting in his driveway with his coffee saying, hey, let's go have a cup and chat. Beautiful, beautiful. Great insight, Zach. And I think that idea that you're clearly a connector, so it takes a connector to know a connector and finding two or three folks and actually doing it together is such a, a sensible guidance. So thank you for that. And getting us started as well, Zach, that's a generous act too. So thank you for both of those. Anybody else, that open question of what's alive for you now? Uh, Amy, I see your hand is up. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, I think what struck me is uh, Gord was in my group in that what he's working on and what something I've been working on is really at the level of story and really interested in seeing John have story and there is the asset. Um, and so just that that's kind of been a space that I've been in. It's kind of alive for me is how the stories help that we can that are um, illuminated at the local level can help change the narrative perhaps even if the dominant culture has. And there's this whole body of work I've been excited about, about narrative change as critical to systemic change. And so just that's just stirring for me. I'm trying to put it all together, so. And I think Carrie Lynn is going to speak very, uh, very deeply to that question of you know, our story beings. In the book, we try to play with this idea that stories come to us in two at least two ways one is, is that we receive them often without consent and the other is that we reweave them collectively and we're really interested in both three because you kind of got to have there's unpacking to be done and reweaving and you know uh, it's fascinating amy thank you and thank you for sharing about your work as well let me go to Nancy next, and then I am going to hand over to uh, Carrie Lynn to just share her reflections uh, on the conversation as it's flowed. Nancy. Thank you very much, Carmack. Um, in our breakout group, Donata from Rwanda uh, shared with us um, something that they do in their community on a monthly basis, which is... Um, get together and clean, clean, sweep the streets, do whatever. And they congregate afterwards and just discuss things. And Donata, please correct me if I'm not right. But um, this in, I'm from the village of Chester and we are not a very connected community for a number of reasons. Um, some of us are full-time residents, some of us were born here, some of us are uh, immigrants to the area, um, and this, I believe, would be a fantastic way to get the ball rolling towards connectedness, and I thank you so much, Donata. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful, and, and, and thank you, Nancy. Let me just check in with Donat and see if there's anything you'd like to add to what Nancy has shared. Hi, everyone. Nancy did, Hi, great, did a great presentation for that. Um, I just wanted to add that this is actually a national policy where all Rwandan citizens convene every last Saturday of the month uh, to do general cleaning in their various communities. So everything stops between 8 a.m. to midday to do that general cleaning. But when, uh, when, uh, um, when you were going through the seven functions, it really tallied in well or resonates with that activity where it is, it is about collective action. It's really about, in the process, improving health and wellness of the people because there's some physical activities uh, engaged in actually wa working, but but at the end of the activity, the fact that community members convene to discuss key issues affecting their communities, from you know how best we prevent school dropout to teenage pregnancy to fighting gender-based violence, or even dealing with some of the cases as community members is really. Uh, something that comes out very, very uh, strongly. Otherwise, thank you so much, Nancy and Thanks. Chris. Uh, my goodness. 
Thank you, Donata. And it's, it's really powerful to hear you describing how starting with one way of organizing opens up the possibility of all kinds of other uh, functions being taken on as well. Um, beautiful. Feels like a good way to go with the time that we've left is to give as much time as we can to Carrie Lynn, uh, who's been listening. She's been our keynote listener and really listening deeply um, and is going to give a, a final reflection and perhaps then just uh, allow Eileen to close us out formally. So, Carrie Lynn, over to you. And, and thanks to everybody for your contributions, those who spoke and those who listened. Thank you so much. Um... There was so many great things that that um, you said, and John, I I want to thank you because every every time I talk to you, um, you tend to start our, uh, you tend to start conversations and discussions um, with story, and your story about the rock and um, seeing so many things that you can use in your community uh, ha really resonated with me, um, and I. And, and I heard it uh, again and again in this session that the importance of story, um, I think to how we relate to one another, to how we relate to our communities is so vital. Um, I, I pulled on a few quotes out of uh, what was said and, and that was, um, this was written for doers. So that is very much uh, what I found as I read the book was, as somebody who works with community leaders uh, or community doers, um, this, this has been a critical um, uh, piece of work that will, will help communicate that. Um, I really liked uh, what you said, Cormac, about other reliant, not self-reliant. So we're reliant on others. And if we can remember that, about that collectivity, um, I, I think that that is at the very basis of, of the work um, we do in our communities and um, ending it off with that celebration of what is possible where we live. You know, this book is really about that celebration. And um, I was saying this to Cormac at break. Um, for me, uh, oftentimes working in community, it's about bringing hope to the community. And um, I think the Connected Community book will will uh, help you, I think, find what Zach was talking about, you know, find that that collective um, vocabulary uh, to talk about ABCD. And um, I think much of what you've written really has has resonated with me um, as a as an Indigenous person who who attempts to take ABCD and bring um, Indigenous understandings of community uh which we hear Cody called building on abundance um you know ABCD is not new to indigenous people we've been collecting and using our gifts for thousands of years our communities couldn't have survived if we didn't do that um but but ABCD and I think in particular this book has really given us that shared vocabulary um I when I first learned about ABCD um I think it took me a while to recognize that it is not just a practice, but it is a lens through which we look at the world. And too many of us, um, especially in indigenous communities, have been seen uh, with a lens of deficit. Uh, and, and we've heard it so much that some of us started to believe that. And I just wanna say that it's not true. Um, if we look at our lens, if we look at our, uh, our world or our communities or ourselves even, um, through that lens of abundance. Um, there is much to see and much to celebrate. So we came up with um, some principles, uh, which we call Indigenous Principles of Abundance. And these really came out of uh, about 40 stories that we had collected from Indigenous graduates over the last 11 years. And we asked them that very question that John asked us earlier, what can we do together um, with what we have? And so the I'm going to go through these just quickly. So the first is every person and community has gifts within. So if we can look at our our communities and see that abundance that's there, and and I think it's really about re a remembering. You know, it always starts with what we already have. Um, it's already there, and again, that starts with spirit. As Indigenous people, we bring our, we bring. Um, I think something special we bring to the world is, is our spirituality. And when we start with that, 
um, the spirit, if when we start with spirit and we bring that into our space, it changes the energy to which we we do our work. And so that is something I think uh, that is in that is unique to our communities. You know, relationship and connections are always at the center. And uh, in any community, if you ask, um, that often resonates. Um, asking, listening, and sharing our stories is key. And we heard that over and over again. Yeah, you know, I was saying to, to Cormac over the break, you know, uh, the things that I that that still stick in my mind from the book are that idea of the mosaic, you know, bringing those different colors of glass, um, looking under that stone that John talks about, um, those dads showing up in the in the halls of the school, um, the weavers, the looms, the seven functions are like the threads of that of of that um, tapestry. Um, indigenous leaders involve others, uh, like like Cormac talked about in the end. You know that that the importance of of inclusion, and um, and lastly, how do we come to that shared vision? We we do that by sharing our stories, and how do we make decisions? You know, and how do we make decisions that honor not just the generations that are now, but those ones that are coming in the future? So while these principles may not resonate with everyone. Um, these are things that, and themes that that my colleagues and I have uh, gone through those stories and 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 found resonated with us. And so those are some of the ones that we brought forward. And uh, thank you so much for for giving me some time to share those. And I will um, pass it back to Eileen. And thanks again to both John and Cormac for your time today. So thanks everybody, Brian. Uh, you can maybe take that screen down. Um, you know, thank you, Carrie Lynn. Thank you for also offering that important perspective around principles and bringing value into into everything that uh, John and Cormac were able to share with us today. Um, I've, I'm taking away so much, just as we, as you've mentioned, Carrie Lynn, um, the, uh, the 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 ideas around the seven functions. Um, the ways in which we then weave it um, into the work that we're doing here at the Cody and others. I've, I was thinking about the contributions we make and, and my own responsibility in all of those categories that you've listed as asset, asset cont contributions, John. Um, and it helped me rethink a little bit how we might want to move forward or how do we come back to and ground ourselves, whether we're in an association or an organization like Cody or the ones that you might be affiliated with um, that are uh, people joining our call today. Um, and it's also about, uh, I feel a wholeness um, that we're talking about community development, that we're talking about, as Moses Cody would say, a full and abundant life for all. It's not just an economic gain. It's not just about ensuring um, infrastructure and you know looking at things in their individual categories or sectors. But it's a it's it's this idea of the connection points, or as you said, and Carrie Lynn reiterated that mosaic. So so I want to thank you very very much. Thank you, Cormac. Thank you, John. Um, again, uh, every time we we get a chance to interact with you here at Cody, um, it uh, at the ABCD Institute um, stewards overall, it's such a pleasure, and it just is reaffirming that we are all on the same path, and we're and we're moving in a good direction. Thank you again, Carrie Lynn, also. I wanna end just by also saying this is not the end to the conversation, but actually in about a little bit, maybe in about a month's time, we would like to have a second workshop and, and invite Cormac and John back again. Um, but this time have hearing from some of our Cody graduates and partners that are located in Africa and in Asia um, to lead the discussion in terms of how they are in, implementing ABCD, how they're how they look at their assets and contributors um, and those functions and 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 then allow you a chance to discuss it. So stay tuned. Um, all of you that you, uh, that joined our call today will uh, announce another one very soon um, uh, once we get the timing sorted out with with Cormac and John and others. Um, and looking forward to us continuing this and as always and and thanking you for um, for joining us today and, and doing the good work that you're doing in each of your neighborhoods. So thank you very much, everybody. I think some people wanted to stay on for a follow-up debrief. 
So we'll leave the we'll leave this open for you to do so. Um, and uh, and uh, every otherwise have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thanks to all. Go well. Thanks. Thanks, Eileen. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank Honestly, uh, John, Eileen, thank you so very much for for being a part of this. It's really uh, wonderful to hear some of the things that are happening. It's good to hear the the book in practice and uh, thinking about some of these things across. I, I know here in Canada, uh, Carrie Lynn and I are here in Calgary, and there's a I think a lot of pent up desire to see um, not just connectedness, but what that does for society as a whole. Um, I'm thinking a lot of the, the conversations around social impact, both um, from a, a societal economic level and at, a, at an individual level and what it does for the person's perception of who they are. Um, there's actually a, a link, Carrie Lynn, that uh, you and I might want to talk about around um, Indigenous uh, opportunities. There's a gentleman, his name is Sean Loney. Um, is he familiar to you? No, uh, he's done a significant amount of work in the social impact world in Winnipeg specifically. He's here in, in Calgary. Um, I met with him and a group of, uh, of other leaders at uh, MRU's Changemaker Studio. Um, they hosted some, some work and, and uh, he's doing a presentation up in Edmonton uh, with, specifically with Indigenous leaders around uh, economic development and a, a sense of ownership and building the the economy. Um, they've done work in uh, both the energy sector and the the food desert sector in northern reserves in Manitoba. Um, they've installed, I think, six million dollars worth of um, geothermal pumps in reserves that had struggles with energy and heating costs. And all of this does so much to build just the internal value and seeing how an individual's contributions to society is so much, um, has so much potential and it's just wonderful. The group is called Encompass Co-op um, and Sean is, is kind of a, a, an anchor for that, but there's, there's so many different initiatives that I see as potentials, uh, both here locally and, and as examples that we can take to other parts of Canada and the world around how do we really sustainably shift when we come together, locking arms and saying we're in this together um, without a profit motive, without some of the, the barriers that we've created ourselves. So that's a lot of where my headspace is at. Um, mm. I've done everything from public policy down to, I was a paramedic firefighter working down near Blood Tribe, Kainawa area here in Alberta. And I, I've seen both the good and the bad across this country and there's potential. It's just a matter of us taking initiative and, and leading sometimes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for pointing Sean out. John, you're muted, just, just to let you know. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Zach. Yeah, I don't know have, Sean's no. work. I thought we were going to have sort of a debrief, but but the debrief, <laughs> the, the only person here who's a part of that <laughs> is Carl <Tara> Lynn. <laughs> what, what happened to, uh, to Cormac and okay. to Eileen? Yeah, I'm not sure. No, they, they bailed on it. It's all good. It's yeah, all good. well. At any rate, good to be with you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so I, much, John, and, and thanks. I look forward to the next time. That sounds great. I'd love to have uh, the, the people who are the first on the land <laughs> inform right. us. Yeah. Yeah, good. All yeah. right, bye-bye. Bye for now, John. Thanks so much. Bye, John.